the last couple of lectures we have been uh, looking at the wave properties of light and so we have uh, defined the concept of phase of a light wave and then based on the phase of the light wave we have uh, uh, said okay light waves go through interference phenomena and uh, through that you know by looking at constructive and uh, destructive interfer interference. Uh, we have been looking at how uh, light tends to <coughs> be brighter at certain spots and not so bright at other spots. So, we took the example of uh, Young's uh, double slit experiment and then we extended to uh, multiple slits and then we came to the conclusion that uh, when you go for multiple slits more number of interfering sources, you have a more constrained interference criteria which provides you uh, much better selectivity in the response. And so, we had uh, taken the specific example of wavelength selectivity, but in general phi is given by 2 pi over lambda d sin theta. So, even for uh, a constant wavelength, you can say that spatially when you look at the interference pattern, the spatially the interference pattern is going to be much more sharper uh, when you consider multiple uh, sources of interference. And uh, we are going to be looking at uh, some examples. Of course, we looked at an example of a, a compact disc um, last in the last lecture. So, we said okay, the CD has multiple grooves which uh, essentially provide you this interference criteria. So, you can separate out colors and that actually is a subset of a uh, a larger uh, you know uh, class of components called diffractive components. So, just the uh, principles that we have looked here in terms of multiple slits can be ex uh, extended to having optical components which are called diffractive components, uh, diffractive optics which uh, essentially allow you to uh, change the characteristics of light. How? Um, so, if light is going in a particular direction, it allows you to bend light or direct light in a particular at, uh, at a particular direction. Okay? Um, and of course, when we look at this interference criteria, what this tells you is that okay, you can direct light into multiple orders. Right? The zeroth order would correspond to the same direction that the incident light had but then first order, second order, third order and so on is going to have different directions defined by uh, this uh, theta, right. So, so uh, different orders are going to have different uh, directions, right. Or you could do some manipulation with the uh, phase at the point of uh, the slit, okay. Um, and you will you'll have specific uh, examples of that as part of the tutorials where uh, you could direct light into a particular order. Okay? So, this is a general criteria where we say okay, it is uh, the incident light which has a very specific direction is actually um, you know diffracted into multiple orders but you could also come up with uh, manipulations at the point of the slits through which you can direct most of your light in a particular direction and, and, and that is similar to the concept that you might have encountered in antennas. You know you have something called phased array antennas, right? Have you heard of that phased array antennas? So, by manipulating the phase and the amplitude uh, with each of those, uh, uh, you know, uh, sub antennas, you can actually, uh, you know, have a very specific radiation pattern. In fact, you have a radiation pattern that can scan across different directions just by manipulating uh, uh, the, the phase, uh, the uh, relative phase between the different uh, 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 antenna elements. So, similar concepts can be possible here as well. You understand that? So, you could you could direct most of your energy in a particular direction and, and 
it's a slightly more advanced concept. We don't have time to go into that, but we'll try to uh, give you a sample of that through the tutorials. You'll work out one problem um, in that. Okay, so this uh, specific configuration of um, this multiple slits, uh, but we can easily see that similar principles can be extended to uh, when you consider something like um, this uh, Fabry Perot. Sorry, I meant to just highlight this, right? So, uh, when you consider Fabry Perot, you are essentially having uh, multiple reflections and uh, all these uh, different reflected components are, are essentially going to um, constructively interfere at this, at this particular point which allows light to uh, go through. So, um, you could potentially extend this concept of multiple interference to uh, this Fabry Perot case as well. Um, only difference will be that in a case of a Fabry Perot, you would have uh, a certain um, reflectivity for the mirrors. So, the reflectivity in terms of uh, power uh, and uh, if you want to look at it in terms of the amplitude, it would be root of r uh, for each of the mirrors. So, the reflected components essentially are going to have lesser and lesser amplitude. Okay, um, so all the interfering components are going to have lesser and lesser amplitude and that is different from the uh, case that we were uh, looking at. Um, I thought there was, yeah, okay. The, the case that we were looking at over here, um, so when we were talking about uh, a, a phasor diagram, uh, we said in this multi-slit case, you have equal intensity for each of these phasors, right? Equal amplitude for each of these phasors. But if you have a configuration like a Fabry Perot, where you have a reflectivity, okay, which is less than 100 percent, each time it goes through a bounce, it's going to lose some of the light, right? So, the phasors are not going to be equal, they're going to be diminishing in terms of the, uh, in terms of their amplitude. So, correspondingly, you have a, a slightly different result. But nevertheless, uh, most of the other principles in terms of uh, the number of interfering sources defining the, uh, the interference criteria, uh, the, the, the constraint in the interference criteria, all those things would carry on, okay? So, let us move on from here. Um, let's actually, uh, you know, towards the end of the last lecture, we were looking at this Michelson interferometer, okay? And um, uh, we, well, the Michelson interferometer is essentially this uh, configuration over here. And uh, we said um, you, could, you could basically uh, split it into two arms and in the two arms you put a mirror and de uh, deflect it back and if you are observing the interference output, that output would depend on the relative phase that uh, uh, the light waves in the two arms have accumulated. And, uh, then you come up with this criteria that the path length difference, if it is a m lambda over 2, it corresponds to constructive interference. Now, some of you are wondering um, where is this factor of 2 come into the picture, right? Because uh, in the multi slit case, we said the path length difference has to be equal to m lambda, and here we are saying m lambda by 2. Where does the factor of 2 come from? Come from? The fact that it's taking a bounce, it's taking a round trip. Now, of course, if you can, you can choose to um, represent the path length difference as 2 into d1 minus d2, in which case it is m lambda, okay? So, there's no magic about this uh, uh, factor of 2 here. Okay, so what we want to do is, uh, we want to extend this concept of Michelson interferometer to introduce one more concept. Okay, and that concept uh, is, is coherence of light. Okay, um, 
So, to give you an idea of uh, what coherence is all about, so far in all our examples, we, cons we have made two assumptions, okay, or at least in the case of a Michelson, one of those assumptions was that we have monochromatic light because we have been looking at all these interference con conditions with respect to only one wavelength, right. So, this is actually for a monochromatic wave. And when we were talking about double slit, we said we have a plane wave that is incident on this double slit, okay. Guess what? In reality, there is no such thing as a perfect monochromatic source. There is no such thing as a perfect plane wave source, okay. You have something that is very close to that, but not e exactly that, okay. In reality, these are um, polychromatic. And these also have, uh, these are not absolutely planar wave fronts, uh, these, uh, these light waves. So, what is the effect of that on the interference and how do you uh, quantify that? That quantification, what we are going to see is through this coherence, uh, uh, what we call as either temporal coherence or spatial coherence. So, let us go ahead and try to define all these terms. So, let us let's start with uh, looking at the coherence property of light. And I should uh, have, uh, you know, give a disclaimer here. Um, this coherence property of light, which actually leads you towards the uh, quantum optical principles of light, uh, is a fairly deep subject, okay. And what we are doing here as far as this course is concerned is just giving you, you know, we are just skimming through that topic just to give you a basic feel for what this is all about. Um, and of course, if you are interested, you can go into, uh, uh, you know, a deeper uh, reading of, of this topic, okay. There is much more available there. So, let us actually um, look at um, this, let us take this example of a Michelson once again. Um, we have a uh, uh, a, a beam splitter here which splits light, let us say in two ways, okay. So, you have a light beam coming in that is getting split and you put a mirror over here and a mirror over here, bounce it back, this also bounce back and then we are observing over here, okay. Now, uh, we have not actually defined many of these optical components. A mirror, you can say, uh, corresponds to a, a metal coated uh, a substrate, okay, so that can act like a mirror. But there is also something called dielectric mirrors. Um, and similarly, with a beam splitter, also, uh, you know, if you want to achieve a perfect 50 50 split, what you use is what is called a dielectric coated mirror, okay. And uh, there again, some of the principles that we have uh, talked about in terms of uh, handling phase, okay, is, is going to come into the uh, picture. So, you are going to track phase as it goes through multiple layers. So, at any one of these interfaces, so I am actually deviating from this topic a little bit, but all these dielectric mirrors will have um, two material NH and NL. So, let us say NH corresponds to a high refractive index material and NL corresponds to a low refractive index material. And if you have alternating layers of that and then uh, if you have a, a wave that is incident on it, it is going to go through reflections at each of those interfaces where the refractive index is different, right. So, that is uh, what you call as Fresnel reflection and uh, all these, uh, ref, uh, you know, uh, components that are reflected, if they are all in phase, they will all add up together and, and you, will, you will get perfect reflection. All the light that is going forward, it is all going to get reflected. Or you could have a lesser number of layers through which you do not reflect all of the light, 
you you reflect part of the light let's say 50% of the light and then the other 50% is going over here that will be a partially reflecting mirror okay so you can make you know mirrors using some of the principles that we talked about so far um, what you have to do is essentially look at what is the relative uh, phase of all these components that are getting reflected from the different interfaces okay uh, of course this and, and we will have a tutorial problem on this concept as well so you can appreciate some of the uh, details of this um, but you could go to the extent of um, connecting to Bragg diffraction theory you you all have in high school learnt about Bragg diffraction right so if you have a periodic arrangement of uh, atoms uh, if you come in with the x-ray radiation then you have uh, these x-rays diffracted and, and they all constructively interfere in a particular direction right through that you can possibly tell what is the period of this atomic spacing right so that that uh, you know principle is is not very different from what we are learning here about multiple slit interferometry or in this case multiple layer interference okay so you can you can say that this multiple layer interference is actually a one dimensional bragg reflector the, in that in that sense okay so i'm just uh, connecting you uh, connecting this to uh, some of the concepts you may uh, be already familiar with but nevertheless coming back to the michelson so we defined uh, things such that okay this distance we called as d1 this we called as d2 and uh, we were looking at um, uh, delta phi which we said is uh, uh, 2 pi over lambda uh, 2 multiplied by d2 minus d1 this we said has to be equal to 2 pi m for uh, constructive interference criteria and then uh, we said okay um, in this we can uh, essentially cancel 2 pi and then come up with this uh, expression that we were seeing uh, previously which is uh, d2 minus d1 equals to m lambda over 2 okay so suppose i am looking at this i i move one of these mirrors okay so initially let's say i have this condition that d2 equals to d1 right and then i start moving one of these mirrors right so i'm uh, plotting d2 and i'm plotting the intensity of light that i get over here and uh, what do you see if i start from let's say d1 right what do I get to see? So at that point it's maximum, right? Because the phase difference is zero, and then it's gonna go through this, and then it's gonna go through a, a maxima, minima, maxima, minima, and so on, right? So uh, of course you can define uh, the the next maxima to be happening at uh, d1 plus lambda over 2 the minima would correspond to d1 plus lambda over 4 and so on um, but the key point here is that we are saying that the intensity uh, is going to be constant okay um, irrespective of whatever the value of d2 is okay and uh, we'll now you know question this this particular assumption okay um, is this constant for whatever d2 okay now to do that we'll have to examine um, uh, what we are ob observing 
a little more closely. Okay, so you are observing the beating of um, u n of t with uh, u two of t, right? And in fact, as we saw, we are observing um, the complex. Uh, you know, u1 and u2 are complex quantities, uh, quantities, so the beating would correspond to u1 conjugate u2 and then u2 conjugate u1, right? So, if we look at this and then we look closely at what u2 of t means, what does u2 of t in this case? Is it different from u1? Yes, it is different, it is going through a different arm and then the different uh, distance is different, but otherwise is it different? Not really, it came from the same source. So, I can basically write this as u1 star of t and then u1 of t plus tau and of course, when we are making a measurement, we are not making a instantaneous measurement, right? If you are to make the instantaneous measurement, uh, the light frequency uh, at 1 micron, it corresponds to 10 power 14 hertz, okay? So, the, when you talk about the time scales, the light, the period with, with which this, this oscillation happens, that period corresponds to some femtoseconds. So, we are not doing any measurement in femtoseconds. So, what we are doing in general is a time averaged measurement. So, what we are observing is this quantity. Now, does that tell you something, the structure of this, does that remind you of something? That is the correlation. In, in this case, it is the same source, so it is basically uh, autocorrelation function. So, through the Maxander, <clears throat> what you are really observing is the autocorrelation function, okay? Now, if you have a, a plane wave, a plane monochromatic wave, okay? So, that is what we are assuming, it is a plane monochromatic wave. If you have a plain monochromatic wave incident on it, then um, you can basically uh, say it is going to have, uh, that light wave is going to have a certain uh, um, amplitude, uh, let us say uh, u naught, right? And, uh, and then as far as the phase is concerned, um, you have uh, e power j uh, omega naught t, if it is a, if it is a monochromatic source, then you can uh, write it as uh, e power j omega naught t and then this one is going to be um, u naught e power j omega naught t plus tau, right? And uh, if you take a conjugate of uh, u1, so that corresponds to minus over here. So, the result that um, when what, what you get out of there is basically u naught square e power j omega tau, right? Now, this autocorrelation function, let us say uh, we represent this as g of tau, okay? You can now define another um, uh, quantity, let us say this is, uh, let us call this the degree of coherence. So, the degree of coherence is small uh, g of tau and uh, that is nothing but this capital G of tau divided by uh, this u conjugate of t by u of t. So, this is nothing but the total intensity 
in that uh, in that in that way so what we are uh, doing is in 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 uh, defining the degree of coherence we are basically uh, taking this g of t which is which we call as the temporal coherence function and we are normalizing that we are normalizing that with the intensity so g of t is now a normalized coherence uh, representation in, which, in what we call as the degree of coherence and um, if you look at the uh, you know uh, de the, the magnitude of that degree of coherence g of tau magnitude of that that magnitude what does that correspond to for a monochromatic wave so what will be the magnitude of g of tau for a monochromatic wave that will be the magnitude so you are not, you have a u not square but u not square is going to get cancelled here the denominator so what you will have here is just you know magnitude of e power j omega tau which is 1 right so for a monochromatic wave g of magnitude of g of tau will be equal to 1 okay and you can uh, also define on the other end of uh, this this uh, you know uh, spectrum where we say um, if you have a totally uncorrelated sort of source then that is going to be g of tau equal to 0 so g of tau is essentially something that's going to take values of less than or equal to 1 greater than or equal to 0 okay so we say 1 corresponds to a perfectly coherent source in this case uh, what you call as a monochromatic source and uh, uh, you know uh, g of tau equals 0 corresponds to a um, perfectly incoherent source okay so <clears throat> when we look at what this monochromatic uh, wave represents let's let's look at this um, in in uh, time right in in time this monochromatic wave is going to be a nice uh, periodic function right so this is with respect to time so that would imply let me call that as nu in frequency how would that be a delta function right a delta function with uh, nu naught as the uh, frequency right now this is this is a perfect monochromatic source but and that that would be an ideal source okay but when you look at non ideal sources or practical sources what you see in them is something like this as a function of time essentially it's going to have if you take a uh, Fourier transform if you look at the uh, power spectral density that power spectral density is going to look something like this it has a center frequency nu naught but uh, a width that corresponds to delta nu when we have a mixture of multiple frequencies you do not have a perfect periodic sort of pattern you, you, you have non-descript pattern as far as the temporal uh, behavior is concerned. The key point uh, here is that if you look at the autocorrelation of something like this so what we are plotting here is s of nu which is the power spectral density 
So, we are plotting S of nu over here as well, okay. So, if you look at, if you know the power spectral density of a source, you have an expression uh, or we have a theorem which is um, called Weiner Kinchin theorem. Have you heard of the Weiner Kinchin theorem? We have done something in communications, a signal processing, you might have come across that. What the Weiner Kinchin theorem says is that the power spectral density and the autocorrelation function, they have you know a connection between them. Essentially both of these are Fourier transform pairs. So, S of nu can be written as minus infinity to plus infinity, G of tau exponential of minus J 2 pi mu tau d tau. So, what you what you see is that you know the, the both these um, you know the power spectral density and the autocorrelation function are are, uh, uh, are connected with each other. So, knowing the autocorrelation function you can compute the power spectral density or conversely knowing the power spectral density you can compute the autocorrelation function. So, if you do this, this uh, inverse Fourier transform, so what you will find is g of tau over here as a function of tau and you will find that the autocorrelation function is something like this and do not worry about the shape of this because the shape, the specific shape of this depends on the specific shape of the power spectral density, right. Um, but when we look at uh, uh, with respect to the delay that we are imposing, you would, you would essentially see that this uh, coherence function uh, means that it will, it will actually be maximum when the delay is 0, but it starts falling down once you start having a delay. So, why is this relevant? Now, you go back and look at what we were discussing over here. We were essentially saying that it, as you move one of the mirrors, we are trying to figure out how the response will be, okay. And for a monochromatic wave, the response will be like this that the, it will go to the maximum to the same point uh, as you move d2 to infinity, right. That is that's what it says here. But for non-ideal sources, which are polychromatic in nature, when you have uh, a frequency spread, that coherence, the temporal coherence is actually limits your interference. Okay. So, it limits your interference such that instead of this, you may have, if, if this is my um, average point, then the envelope of this would essentially go like this. So, you would not reach the uh, maxima completely, you would not reach the minima completely. And at some point, it will it will just be the uh, uh, you know as if the, the the two beams are not interfering at all. So what what we are essentially doing, maybe I, I didn't make this explicit, is we are looking at the autocorrelation between two of these wave fronts. Okay, so so. So, as we move the distance d2, you are like looking at farther and farther out in, in space or in time, 
Okay, so these two are uh, uh, reversible. So you can you can go back in, in time or in space, and you take different components of the uh, of waves from uh, different wave fronts from the same source, and you're looking at how well they are correlated, right? And uh, and what we are saying is, if it's a polychromatic source, that correlation holds good only for a certain time or a certain distance okay so and and beyond that it will it will start uh, reducing in, in terms of uh, the the overall uh, contrast between the maxima and minima and that reduction is is essentially defined by the envelope of this autocorrelation function so effectively what we are saying is when we are looking at the um, Maxenda interferometer uh, output, uh, let's say we are looking at this as a function of uh, tau and uh, let's plot this as um, um, i over 2 times i naught. So, 2 times i naught uh, corresponds to uh, you know the i naught would be the intensity in each of the arms. So, okay, so it, it can reach a maximum of 2 times i naught. So, when we look at this, what we will find is that envelope will follow. So, this takes a value of uh, 2 over here and 1 and 0 over here and uh, so the, that, that takes an envelope like this and inside this if we uh, look at the uh, specific interference pattern, that interference pattern would be like would be something like this okay so do you understand so this is so as we are moving d2 we don't retain the same contrast okay as we go to longer and longer values of d2 or longer path length differences you don't have the same contrast and uh, this where it where it goes to half that contrast is what you call as uh, the coherence time okay the the width over which you uh, go to half the contrast is is the uh, coherence time okay and 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 what we are also saying here is that the coherence time is inversely proportional to the spectral width okay so uh, uh, that proportionality constant actually depends on whether uh, the the shape of the power spectral density okay so it could be uh, a fraction but but uh, uh, you know tau c can be approximately given as 1 over delta nu. So, larger the spectral width of your source, smaller will be tau c and, and in terms of spatial quantities, you can say this is coherence time and in terms of spatial uh, quantities, you can define what, what you can call as longitudinal coherence length LC, LC is going to be C times tau C where C is the velocity of light in, in, in vacuum, right or free space. So, in terms of length, it is just uh, directly proportional to uh, tau C.
So, um, I will just take a minute to uh, give you some examples of uh, different sources and uh, the, the corresponding um, coherence time and, and the coherence length. So, uh, let us look at um, sunlight which is from 0 0.4 to 0.7 micron wavelength. Uh, you have a, a, a semiconductor LED, let us say at a lambda naught of 1 micron and delta lambda typically corresponds to uh, 50 nanometers. And uh, let us say you also consider a laser diode, the same wavelength lambda naught 1 micron, but delta lambda in this case would be 1 nanometer. And, uh, and we also consider a helium neon laser, which is a lambda naught of uh, 0.633 nanometer and delta lambda, which is in the order of picometers. So, we consider all of this in terms of, uh, let us look at delta nu in hertz and uh, let us look at coherence time and the coherence length. Okay. So, this would correspond to a very wide spectrum. So, this is 3.75 into 10 power 14 and the corresponding coherence time is 2.67 femtoseconds and a coherence length would be 800 nanometers, okay. whereas a semiconductor LED which is a much lesser in spectral width that would correspond to 1.5 into 10 power 13 hertz correspond to 67 femtoseconds and uh, that will correspond to a coherence length of 20 microns. Okay. So, what we are saying is it is sunlight D2, you have perfect condition equal to D1, you get to see some fringes, right? you get to see some maxima and minima, but the moment you move even fraction of a micron, you lose all your fringes. Okay, you you don't you don't have any uh, so it's very hard to uh, make uh, interference fringes with with uh, with the sunlight. Okay, whereas with a laser diode, it's three into ten power eleven, which corresponds to three point three picoseconds, and here the coherence length is in the order of a millimeter, and finally, this is something that we can uh, it's one megahertz is the helium neon laser uh, line width which will correspond to one uh, uh, microsecond coherence time and 300 meters. Even if you take D2 to 300 meters, you still have some visibility. You can still see some 50 percent visibility. Uh, sorry. A six three three oh, thank you. So, yeah, this should be point six three three microns. Thanks for pointing out. Okay, so let me stop at this point. So, what we have just now started is uh, under you know quantifying the coherence of light, and uh, and 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 we say co based on the fact that it's typically a non-monochromatic source that we are dealing with in, in, in practice. The coherence or the uh, range of delays over which we can see interference between uh, these two constituent waves is limited. Okay? So, let me stop at that point and of course, what we are saying is that you know that coherence time or the coherence length is inversely proportional to the uh, width of the so, uh, source spectrum. Okay, so let us stop at this point and we will continue from this point tomorrow. Thank you.